Hi everyone, hope that uh, you're all safe and well. Today, as you can tell, I'm wearing my uh, 2020 World Champion LA Dodgers uh, cap. And I think back to a year ago about this time, I wasn't sure if I would live long enough uh, to be able to see the Dodgers win another World Series after the last one in 1988, 32 years. But what a difference a year makes. What a difference a year makes. In 2020, I'll always remember as a great moment as a Dodgers fan. However, however, I'd like to start us off with a dark moment that most Dodger fans would rather forget. It was not a great moment, but a disgraceful moment, one of poor fan conduct. For those of you who don't know, we go back to August of 1995. The Los Angeles Dodgers forfeited. They lost a game to the St. Louis Cardinals 2-1 to one with one out. I believe it was in the bottom of the ninth inning. The reason? Many in the crowd of 53,000 plus, they littered the field with their promotional baseball, so they threw their baseballs onto the field. The fans displayed their displeasure with the umpire calls and also the umpire ejections from the game of two Dodger players and also their manager, the late Tom Lasorda. And they threw those souvenir baseballs, a promotional giveaway, onto the Dodger Stadium field. And think about it, because those baseballs created a dangerous hazard for not only the umpires, but also for the St. Louis Cardinals team that was out on the field, the umpire crew and its crew chief finally ordered the game ended with the Dodgers forfeiting. And that's the reason that whenever the Dodgers now offer a promotional baseball giveaway to their fans, they do not give the baseballs to each fan as they enter the game, but instead they give the baseball to the fans as they are exiting the game, after the game is over, exiting the stadium. And now you know the rest of that story. Now, the word fan, short for fanatic, it basically means an enthusiastic admirer, an enthusiastic admirer. Now, when the Lord Jesus walked our earth more than 2,000 plus years ago, he also had a tremendous amount of fans. In fact, Jesus attracted huge crowds everywhere that he went. This in response to his authoritative and spirit-led teaching, but also because of the powerful healing miracles that he was doing. However, the Lord Jesus, he wasn't interested in fans. He wasn't interested in Jesus' fans. What he wanted, what he desired, were Jesus' followers. Jesus' followers. So as we continue, continue our journey through the Gospel of John, we now come to the events known as Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' earthly life prior to his death on the cross. Now Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem for the final time on the day that we know as Palm Sunday. And it was on that day that we're told that he was also met by this great crowd of people, enthusiastic fans, Jesus admirers. So let's take a few moments to contrast and highlight the differences between being Jesus fans versus being Jesus followers. So to contrast the differences again between being Jesus fans versus being Jesus followers. So our passage is taken from John chapter 12, verses 9 through 19, a portion of which was shown at the beginning of our message video. But let me read it for us. 
Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So at first his, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, they went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, look how the whole world has gone after him. Now the setting of our passage, where we previously left off, was in the Judean village of Bethany, a village which was located about one and a half miles east of the holy city of Jerusalem. Jesus and the disciples were very familiar with this village because they often stayed there at the family home of two brothers and sisters, their friends Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. The setting followed the greatest of Jesus' earthly miracles to that point, which was the raising, the resurrecting of his friend Lazarus, who had died, who had died and been dead four days previous to their arrival. And after proclaiming the truth that he was, he was the resurrection and the life, Jesus went out and he proved it. He proved it by awakening, calling out, resurrecting a previously dead man, Lazarus, and restoring him to life. But we can imagine when the Jewish religious leaders learned of this resurrection, the supposed miracle that had taken place from eyewitnesses who were there, and also fearing fearing that all the Jewish people would soon turn and follow Jesus and thereby bring the wrath of the Roman Empire upon the Holy Land, these Jewish religious leaders actively made plans. They plotted to kill Jesus. Then six days before the Jewish Passover, a special dinner was held in a home where Jesus was the honored guest. Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and the disciples were all present there. Martha was busy serving Jesus and the other guests, while her brother Lazarus was among those said to be reclining at the table with Jesus. And it was at this special dinner that the other sister, Mary, Mary offered up a most extravagant gift the gift of her heartfelt worship to Jesus as she broke open a container holding a very expensive perfume called nard. Mary probably, probably spent all or most that she had to purchase it. And she then knelt in humble faith before the Lord Jesus. Mary then proceeded to clean and anoint Jesus' feet with that sweet-smelling perfume. 
and we're told that the fragrance, it was pleasant and it was said to have filled the whole house. And then after cleaning and anointing Jesus' feet, Mary proceeded to dry the Lord's feet, not with a towel, but with her own hair. Not caring about the social or cultural norms of that time. And while Judas Iscariot and the other disciples looked on and complained about what they perceived as Mary's wasteful and excessive act of worship, while they did that, the Lord Jesus actually commended Mary. He commended her because what she had done had actually prepared his body for burial. Jesus knew at this time that his death was coming near, his death at the cross. And for this humble, sacrificial act of worship, it brought a smile. It brought a smile to the Lord Jesus' face because it truly honored him. Now, our passage this week, it begins with a large crowd of Jews who had found out and discovered that Jesus was at that house where he had been the guest of honor. This crowd had come not only because of Jesus' presence, but also because of Lazarus' presence, the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. They wanted to see for themselves. And we're told that the Jewish religious leaders, the chief priests, they not only made plans to kill Jesus, but also to kill Lazarus. Because Lazarus, living witness to what Jesus had done, attesting to uh, the Lord's resurrection power, it was causing many of the Jews to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. So Lazarus also had to be eliminated. The setting of the passage then moved back from the village of Bethany to the great city of Jerusalem. It was the day we know as Palm Sunday, and Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a young donkey, the image fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, and this day often referred to as the triumphal entry. A great crowd including residents and religious Jewish pilgrims, had gathered in the city for the festival of the Passover. And the Passover, it was the time when the Jewish people remembered, remembered the Lord God delivering them out of slavery, out of bondage in Egypt centuries earlier. So what are the differences what are the differences between being a Jesus fan versus being a Jesus follower? Well, let's look at a couple of truths. The first one is this. A fan is fickle while a follower is faithful. Again, a fan is fickle while a follower is faithful. Now, this next wonderful uh true story is taken from the Our Daily Bread devotional. It's called The Hotel Clerk. One stormy night, an elderly couple entered the lobby of a small hotel and they asked for a room. The hotel clerk said that they were filled, as were all the hotels in town. He said, but I can't send a fine couple like you out in the rain. And the hotel clerk then added, would you be willing to sleep in my room? The couple hesitated at his generous offer, but the hotel clerk insisted. Then the next morning when the couple was ready to check out and pay their bill, the husband said this to the clerk, you're the kind of man who should be managing the best hotel in the United States. And someday, someday 
I'll build you one. The hotel clerk smiled politely. And then a few years later, the hotel clerk received a letter from that elderly man. Recalling that stormy night where he had helped them, and then asking, asking the hotel clerk to come to New York and enclosed in the letter with the envelope in the envelope with the letter was a round trip ticket. When the clerk arrived, his host, the elderly man, took him to the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street, where there stood a, mag a magnificent new building. Pointing to the building, the elderly man said, that, that is the hotel I have built for you to manage. The elderly man was William Waldorf Astor. And the hotel he pointed to was the original Waldorf Astoria. And the young hotel clerk his name was George C. Bolt, who became its first manager. A powerful story of being faithful. Now the quality of being fickle, fickle is to change frequently one's loyalties, one's interests, or one's affections. Again, the quality of being fickle is to change frequently one's loyalties, one's interests, one's affections. So from our passage, many in the Passover crowd greeted Jesus with, great, with a great celebration. Palm branches, native palm branches, were either waved by some in the crowd or they were placed on the ground in front of the path that was traveled by the donkey carrying Jesus. The palm branches were a symbol. They were a symbol of the Jewish people's national hopes of Israel becoming a great nation, a great kingdom again. And as Jesus passed by in this uh, impromptu parade, Many in that crowd also shouted, Hosanna, meaning save us now. Or they shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. The crowd shouts their greetings were to a Messiah or their thoughts of who the Messiah would be, someone who would kick the Romans out of the Holy Land. However, we're told from the passage, Jesus, the Lord Jesus was not described as very excited about what was going on around him. And the reason for that, he already knew just how fickle, how quickly the attitude of the crowd could and would turn against him. And he was right. On Palm Sunday, the crowd shouted, Hosanna! while five short days later they would shout, Crucify him. Again, the Lord Jesus was not looking for fickle fans, but for devoted, faithful followers. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this, Now faith, faith is a confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. Again, faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The quality of being faithful is to be steadfast, loyal, devoted, devoted to God, regardless, regardless of the circumstances. It's to love the Lord God Believing who he says he is, and then trusting, trusting that he'll care for us. To be faithful, it's to follow him wherever and to whomever he leads us 
in this earthly life. And to be faithful, it's to use whatever, whatever the Lord has gifted us with or given, given to each of us for his greater purposes and for his glory. So a question, a question we should all ask ourselves. In the darkness and in the challenges of these unprecedented times that we're living through, how might the Lord Jesus view each of our lives today? As a fickle fan or as a faithful follower? How might the Lord Jesus view our lives today? as a fickle fan or as a faithful follower. A fan is fickle while a follower is faithful. And another difference uh, between being a Jesus fan versus being a Jesus follower is this. A fan is involved while a follower is committed. Again, a fan is involved while a follower is committed. A local uh, SoCal, Southern Cal artist uh, whose work both Cheryl and I have uh, enjoyed over the years is a man named Robert Marble. And for over 40 years, he's been drawing and painting uh, these cartoons uh, that symbolize our daily lives and also satirize them as well. And one of the prints that I really enjoyed, uh, I still remember it hanging in uh, one of my old roommate's uh, rooms in the apartment that we shared. It was entitled Involvement and Commitment. Involvement and Commitment. And at the top of this print, it had a cartoon picture of a chicken. A cartoon picture of a chicken, it was a hen, and she was sitting atop her nest, and she was proudly holding up her prized egg. Proudly holding up her prized egg. And at the bottom of this print, there was another cartoon picture. This cartoon was of a somewhat nervous looking pig. The pig was sitting, sitting on the ground and pointing at itself. And the great caption at the bottom of the print described it all. It said, in a ham and egg breakfast, in a ham and egg breakfast, the chicken is involved while the pig is committed. Again, in a ham and egg breakfast, the chicken is involved while the pig is committed. The big difference between involvement and commitment. From our passage, we're told that the crowd of people who had seen the Lord Jesus raise Lazarus from the grave, they had come with Jesus, they had followed him and the disciples from the village of Bethany to the city of Jerusalem. And this crowd had continued to spread the word to those in the great city of this miracle-working Messiah who even raised people from the grave. Even raised people from the grave. And as we can imagine, word soon got out in Jerusalem and many went out to meet Jesus and to hail him as their earthly king. And you can say that at that point, the people in the crowd were involved. Involved to the utter outrage and frustration of the Jewish religious leadership. But we need to also remember this. Again, just a few short days later, that same crowd of people, they would stand back and do nothing. They would stand back and do nothing as Jesus was crowned with thorns and then executed by the religious leaders and the Romans. And many in that crowd also 
would literally turn on Jesus. Many in the crowd would literally turn on the Lord Jesus, shouting again for him to be crucified. Again, the crowd was involved, but not committed to the Lord Jesus. And from our passage, we're also told that the disciples, they did not understand the fulfillment of the scriptures at that moment. And it was only after, after the Lord Jesus was glorified, so following his crucifixion, following his resurrection from the dead three days later, and then after his ascension back up to heaven, it was only then that the disciples remembered what had been written or prophesied about Jesus had actually been done to him. However, for the disciples, excluding Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, for the disciples, they were fully committed to the Lord. They were committed to Jesus and they followed him. And this is what the Lord Jesus meant for followers of his, for followers, not fans. From Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. From the New uh, Living Translation. And for those original followers, disciples of Jesus, they were committed to him. They denied themselves. They let go of, they left behind things such as their livelihoods, their jobs, the security of family, and also the comforts of home. They denied themselves. They took up their crosses. They sacrificed themselves to the Lord Jesus, dying to their self-centeredness, dying to their selfishness, and then literally dying at the cost of their very lives as they spread the word about the risen Lord. They denied themselves, they took up their crosses, and they followed Jesus. They followed him wherever the road, wherever the journey took them. Even though they might not comprehend or understand where they were going or why they were going, even when it was not the popular thing to do to follow Jesus, they followed him. The disciples willingly trusted, obeyed, and followed their Lord. And likewise, uh, some 2,000 plus years later, followers of Jesus today must be more than involved. They, we, as followers, must be committed to him. We likewise must be willing to deny ourselves, to let go of or to leave behind those things in our lives which become idols. They get in the way of our relationship with God. They keep us from getting close to him. So we likewise must deny ourselves. We likewise must be willing to take up our crosses, sacrificing ourselves to our Lord, dying to our own self-centeredness, our selfishness, and even at the cost of our own earthly lives as well. We must be willing to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses, and likewise follow Jesus. Wherever, wherever our shared road with him or journey takes us, 
even when we don't comprehend or understand what the Lord is doing. And even when it's not politically correct or the popular thing to do so in following him, that we continue to follow him. And in the same way, to trust him, to obey him, and to follow him into the future. A fan is involved while a follower, a follower is committed. So what does it look like to be not a fan, but a follower of Jesus? Let me close our time with a powerful true story. I didn't know about this until um, today, actually, of the cost of following Jesus. This is the history of the popular hymn, the popular song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I Have Decided to Follow Jesus is a well-known Christian hymn that originated not in the United States, not in the UK, England, but it originated in the state of Assam, India, in India. According to Dr. P. Purinju Job, the lyrics of the song are based on the last words of a man named Naksing, a native uh, Indian man from the tribe of Meghalaya, which then was located in the state of Assam, which is northeastern India. This man and his family decided to follow the risen Jesus in the middle of the 19th century through the efforts of a Baptist missionary. The tribe Noxang and his family belonged to before knowing Jesus, after hearing that he had uh, become a Christian, they wanted him to stop believing. They wanted him to stop putting his faith in Jesus Christ. And for that reason, Noxang was called to renounce his faith by the village chief. However, Noxing refused to renounce his faith in the risen, uh, in the risen Lord, courageously declaring, "I have decided to follow Jesus." His words. Then the chief ordered the man's Noxing's two children to be killed. Noxing was devastated yet unrelenting. And the courageous follower of Jesus was then reported to have said these words, Though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. The man's wife, following those words that were spoken, was then also killed by the order of the chief. And as Nok Sang himself faced his execution, he was reported to have said these final words. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. This display of faith by Nok Sang and his family it greatly influenced and then led to the conversion of that same village chief and then the people of Noxing's village. They all placed their faith in and became followers of the risen Jesus behind the powerful testimony of Noxing and his family. Now the formation of those powerful last words into a folk song. It was attributed to an Indian missionary named Sadhu Sundar Singh. The original famous haunting melody is also Indian influenced. And then in 1959, an American hymn editor named William Jensen Reynolds, he composed the arrangement to that song which spread the hymn's popularity not only in the United States, 
but around the world. A powerful, responsive hymn which speaks of the faithfulness, which speaks of the commitment our Lord desires for all, for all who would not be fans of his, but for all who would be his devoted followers. And in the words of the late Paul Harvey, and now you know the rest of the story. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the awesome and great gift of your salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the forgiveness of humanity's sins. Thank you, Lord, that because of Lord Jesus' sacrifice at the cross in our place and on our behalf, it allows each of us the opportunity by faith to be born again, to have a personal relationship with you. And please help us, Lord, not to be Jesus fans, fair weather, fickle fans, but instead to be faithful, committed Jesus followers. And Lord, please help us and empower us in these dark and unprecedented times in which we're living. And I think of, uh, I think of that cancel culture uh, going on right now. Please help us to stand strong and please help us to follow you. Please help us, Lord, though none go with us. Please help us, Lord, carrying our crosses. And please help us, Lord, in not turning back because we have decided to follow you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for taking time uh, to watch and listen uh, to this video message. Uh, have a blessed week, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Take care.